community, long time no see. We're so glad you took the opportunity this morning to join us for our online services. We pray that there'll be an encouragement to you and your family. So let's get on with it. On with the worship service. Good morning, community. A little bit different person here this morning. Uh, but we're going to be hearing from a bunch of you this morning. And so I would love to lead you in a new song starting into worship this morning that fits with where I believe we're heading. So this song's called Wild River. And if I don't mess it up too badly, we'll learn it together. And then Rich can fix it all when we sing it live together when we're back at church. So uh, hope you like it. It goes like this. I want to teach it to you. And hopefully, like I said, it won't mess it up too bad. So it goes like this. Here we go. There is a fountain that never runs dry. Forever flows with water of life. You never stop moving. You never stop moving. Where your river runs, everything lives. Where your river goes, you'll never thirst again. You never stop moving. You never stop. faces and having conversations with everyone at church. Uh, I hope everyone is being safe and healthy and enjoying this time with their families. And if you have to work like I have been, um, I hope it's been productive and meaningful 
and valuable for you and your families. I'd like to read Romans 8, 1 through 7. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because of through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live accordingly to the flesh, but accordingly to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, and it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raises Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your moral bodies, mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if the spirit, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side? And oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise? Against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. And I would search and stop at nothing, you're just not that hard to find. I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valley all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me you're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands in the heartache going the same Oh how far beneath your glory Does your kindness extend your path From where your feet 
Dressed on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinners pass Oh, how fast would you come running If just a shadow me through the night Trace my steps through all my failures And walk me out the other side Dare ascend that mountain, that valley hill called Calvary. But for the one I called Good Shepherd, who like a lamb was slain for me, I will praise you on the mountains. I will praise you. Mountains in my way, you're the summit where my feet are. I will praise you in the valley of the No less God within the shadows, no less faithful in the night is me to strength. You're the
we have now been justified by his blood much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life more than that we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation I know this might be weird if you're at home in your living room, but I want to encourage you guys to sing this bridge, sing this song out to the Lord, rejoicing that we are saved by his death, by his life, that we are reconciled. Sing this out. Here I stand, high and surrender, I need you now. Hold my
Let your crystals echo. If you are checking us out for the first time, head on over to our website, loving2life.com. That's loving, the number two, life.com. And let us know how we can connect with you this week. We are so excited that you are here. We also want to be praying for you. So go on to our website as well. Um, and you can click the prayer request button and submit your prayer request so we know how we can pray for you. We're going to continue our worship now this morning by giving back to God uh, through our finances. There are two main ways that you can give to community, online, on the website, or by mail. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for technology that allows us to meet today and learn from you. Father God, I pray that you would quiet our hearts today so that we can reflect on the message that Pastor Joel shared with us and prepare for a new week ahead. Lord. Please put your hedge of protection around us as we go through our week this week. I pray that you bless the tithes and the offerings that will be given. And please go before us. Make us sensitive to the needs of the people we are in contact with. And I pray that we will be a blessing and a light to others. In your name, amen. We are excited that you could join us. Um, we are going to jump into this brand new series called Stronger. And as we begin, I want to start with a story. Uh, this is not my story. This is Jesus' story found in John chapter 3. It's a story we don't know a whole lot about the one person in the story, but we do know a lot about Jesus. So the one person we don't know a whole lot about uh, is this lead Pharisee or this scholar that Jesus meets. Um, and so when I say uh, lead Pharisee, what I want you to think about is like the person who would know the Bible the most, frontward, backward, inside out, uh, maybe a president of a huge theological seminary, uh, somebody who you would go to with questions and they have all the answers when it comes to the Bible. So this Pharisee in particular, by the name of Nicodemus, he knows the Old Testament inside and out. He could quote it, he could explain it, he could talk to those who were having questions about, hey, I'm wearing three kinds of fabric. Is that okay? And he'd be like, no, that's not okay. And there's Old Testament laws that, that deal with that. He would know how many steps were allowed to be taken on a Sabbath. He would be able to enforce it. He would tell you chapter and verse, crime and punishment. He would say, here's exactly what you did. Here's what you need to fix it. And so uh, I guess maybe even to put another analogy in, and it's maybe a little painful for some of us right now, sports analogy, since there's not much sports, Think of the uh, rules analyst or the rules expert that they bring into football games that they know the rules, they know the law, they know every small detail by memory. That was Nicodemus. He knew everything there was to know about the Old Testament. He could quote it, and he has some questions when it comes to Jesus. This expert in the Old Testament comes to Jesus and is curious, uh, and he comes to him actually at night, and he he's kind of wondering how on earth it is that he's doing all these miracles. Why how, Why is he the one that's going to be able to do these things? And so he has not really even a question. He just notices, hey, you've been doing these miracles. Um, what's that about? And Jesus gives him an answer in verse 3. Jesus answered uh, Nicodemus in a really weird way. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He tells Nicodemus, you must be a brand new man. You, you have to do a complete do-over here, a brand new birth. 
And this raises many questions for this scholar because he does not see how this fits with the law, the prophecies, or, or where Jesus gets this power and authority to tell him this weird kind of thing of you need to be born again. And so Jesus says in the same conversation, he explains it maybe a little differently to Nicodemus, and he says this a little further in verses 5 and 6 of John chapter 3. Je Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. To which Nicodemus was probably like, I still don't get it. To which maybe you this morning, when you hear that, you're like, that's great. I don't understand what that means. He says there is something that's born flesh is flesh. In other words, uh, our humanity is born humanity. We have flesh. But then there's this also thing that there's a spirit, that when the spirit gives birth, there is something spiritual. So flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. This morning as we talk about flesh and spirit, again, you may have many questions as Nicodemus did. Um, and that's where we want to jump into this series together called Stronger. Because this isn't just about being a stronger person, being a better person, being more uh, nice to your neighbors, being friendlier to your kids. That's, that's not what this series is going to be about. This series is intended uh, to those who may be questioning Christianity, to show you why uh, we are the way we are, to, to maybe explain the differences between what a life in Christ versus a life outside of Christ is like. But it's also for those who are inside of Jesus to encourage you that we have hope for this life and we can be stronger when we realize what Jesus was talking about to Nicodemus in this story and what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8. So we're going to spend this series in an amazing passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those now. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 over the next four weeks because it is such an amazing passage. Um, some commentators refer to Romans 8 as the mountain in the midst of a valley or in the midst of, of desert land. Like, like the whole book of Romans is this flat land. And then you get to Romans 8 and it's this mu magical, beautiful piece of scripture that rises amongst the Roman letter and gives us this amazing hope to be stronger when it comes to Christ and to be in our own personal life. So it's, it's, um, it's where we're going to spend most of our time. And so here's where we're going to be in the next four weeks. And then we're going to dive right into Romans 8 this morning. So in the next four weeks, you're going to see this. You're going to see, first of all, this, this week is Romans 1 to Romans 8, I'm sorry, 1 to 13. We're going to be in that passage this morning. And then next week, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, 14 to 17. And then Romans 8, 18 to 30. And then lastly, Romans 8, 31 to 39. And we're going to talk about being stronger through surrender today. And then we're going to look at the other passages as we go along. The other cool thing with this series, just as a side note, is that every single week, we want to end our sermon with some practical time for you and your family. It's weird doing this online. Um, but while we're doing this, I don't want this just to be something you sit and watch. I don't want this just to be another uh, thing you flip on the TV and, and, and you, you don't be able to engage your family with. So at the end of every time uh, that I'm preaching on, on this series, we're going to offer time at the end of every sermon to just pray, to direct you in prayer, to lead your family in prayer. And I really encourage you, don't just shut things off, but, but pray specifically um, over the passage we're dealing with. And then the second thing we're going to give you after every sermon and after every prayer time is we're going to give you a, a little bit of kids ministry. And so if you have little ones and they can't make it through the sermon, or if you have little ones and I put them to sleep, which I do, uh, then, then this is going to be an opportunity for them to, to re-engage after the sermon. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple weeks. Okay, so Romans chapter 8. Flesh is flesh, spirit is spirit. Nicodemus and Jesus, what are you talking about? Let's go into Romans uh, chapter 8 together and see, much like Nicodemus, if we can explain this idea of flesh and flesh, spirit and spirit. And then I want to explain how we become stronger because of understanding those things. So, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. This is amazing. This is just, if we just had this verse, it would be amazing. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore... Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. Let's just begin there, right? That there is no, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in 
Christ Jesus. Wow. That means that we have no reason to fear Jesus because he is in us. There is no condemnation for us who are in Christ. He spends all of chapter 7 explaining this whole thing of I do the things I don't want to do, I, I don't want to do the things I do want to do, and I just can't figure this whole Christianity thing out. Paul reminds us at the very front end of this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then he, he, he explains a little bit of what he means by this. He says in verses 2 through 4, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done... What the law weakened by flesh, he says, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. A couple of things. He says, in Christ, if we're going to understand being stronger, the first thing you need to understand is that you have been set free. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He's telling us we were born into sin. We were born that with this sin problem in our humanity. And then he says, but God beat back that problem through sending his son in the likeness of flesh, this is flesh and flesh, sending him into the world as a human to die on our behalf, to break the power of death in flesh. He says, because of Christ, you are free in Jesus Christ. Verses 5 through 8, he goes a little further. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. He says in verse 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That is amazing, but it may be confusing. So let me give you some definitions real quick. When he says flesh throughout this passage, he uses it a lot. He uses the word flesh a lot. He'll use the word spirit a lot. And then he's going to also talk about this idea of setting your mind. Okay, so I want to explain those things and then put it back into the context here. The flesh is that old nature. So when we talk about old nature, it's that thing that we were born human. We were born with sin as a problem because of our humanity. Every person you know was born human, I hope, right? Everybody was born human, and everybody was born with the problem of sin. So when he says that there is flesh, he's talking not just about like flesh and bone. He's talking about that thing that we earned out of Adam and Eve's sin that brought death to all of humanity. It's the sin that we are born with that we need a savior to take us from. So whenever he says flesh, I want you to think that old sinful person that you used to be before Christ, that we all were before Christ. And then he says the spirit. And so he's talking about the Holy Spirit here who, who comes into our lives when we accept Jesus and he puts us in a brand new covenant and we are made alive because of the spirit. That's what he meant when he was talking with Nicodemus. He says, the flesh, the old nature, that's part of all of us. And that will continue to be there unless we are born again, unless we have the Holy Spirit living in us, unless we accept Jesus Christ. So he says this. The other, the other thing he says is set your mind on things, right? He talks about when you set your mind on flesh versus when you set your mind on the Spirit. So when he says set your mind, Paul is saying that because those who are outside of Jesus are flesh, then their minds have been set against God. And because they have nothing but the old nature, it sets the course for the life. It determines their worldview. It impacts their thinking and not the other way around. Paul is telling us that when we are outside of Christ, our entire bent, our entire motivation is set in a course to rebellion against our king, who is God. And that's why we want to be so uh, loving and caring to those who are outside of Christ because they are under the old nature. 
But when we have Christ, he says, he causes us to set our minds on things of Christ. One commentator says it like this when it comes to setting your mind and our thinking. He says, people do not think themselves into the way they act, but act themselves into the way they think. Let me say that again. This is kind of confusing. People do not think themselves into the way they act, but act themselves into the way they think. Here's what he's saying. Those who are born uh, without Christ, which we all were, they're going to think a certain way because of who they are. Those who are in Christ, you're going to think a certain way because Christ is in you. Or at least you should. And, and maybe that's part of the issue we're going to talk about today. Simply put, Jesus said, That which is born of flesh is flesh, our first birth, our physical bodies. That which is born of spirit is spirit, our second birth, or being born again. Think of it as the old nature of you. The one you receive, the once you receive Christ, it dies and has no power over you. The new you is reborn and it is what is alive. I had a friend of mine uh, who had this crazy dream uh, and he was sharing with me this idea of Romans 8 in it. And he said it was the weirdest thing. I was like uh, on this cliff and it was me and me. And he said it was just weird in this dream because I, I was like looking at myself physically and I felt this it sounds weird because I felt this urge that I just needed to push myself over this cliff and, and, and just to let myself die, to, 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 to go and, and push him off. It was a crazy visual. But he said it was this weirdest thing and it was the scariest thing, but it brought Romans 8 to life because what he's saying in Romans 8 is our old self is gone. It's dead and buried and has no power over us. Our new self has been reborn. We have been born again into Christ. And so when he says in verses 5 through 8, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit, he's talking about that brand new birth and death. And he says because we are alive in Christ, because we have this new birth, because our old man, old nature is gone, he says this in verses 9 through 11. This is awesome. You, however, talking about those who are born again, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's amazing. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh. Your old man is gone. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, once you receive Jesus Christ, your spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But, this is awesome, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of the righteousness of God in us. Putting in theological terms, that's justification, right? That's that God canceled all of our debts and made us alive in him. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, so in other words, if God and Christ could raise, them, raise himself up from the dead, then he is living in us and he can resurrect us and our bodies as well. But here's the trouble, right? Okay, Joel, I get it. Old nature, new nature, I, I belong to Christ, so I somehow have this new nature. That's great. But here's the trouble I think that we live in, and here's where stronger uh, we're going to engage in this this morning. While the old man or the old nature may be dead theologically, right? Like you may believe that. And, and while the old man is dead positionally, right? He is dead very much seemingly alive practically, right? He's not silent practically. He, there are so many things that I feel like I, I, I used to do before Christ and I still do them today. I can't shake these habits or these sins and the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I don't want to do, I don't want to do. And the whole thing of Paul, the old man is gone. And yet 
practically day to day, it seems like we're having to fight him all the time. Paul says this, So then, brothers, this is verse 12 and 13, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if this, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Here's the truth this morning. This old nature called the flesh is dead and buried and gone, right? It, this new self is alive and should be and is calling the shots for those in Christ. The new man is alive and should be running our lives. However, I feel that there are many uh, here at Community um, that believe that, yes, but there are many here that feel you still are the old man. You believe that Christ is in you and calling the shots, but you live as if you're still the old person. You're still the old man. You're still the old nature. I want to challenge you this morning through stronger series and especially this passage this morning. Stop living in your old nature. Live in who Christ has called you to be, to which called you to be in freedom, he says in Romans chapter 8. You are not controlled by your old nature anymore. We all need the healthy reminder this morning that the old man is dead and gone. And you are free. You are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And that's who you are. And the question is, why do I still do the things I used to do before Jesus then? Why do I not feel or even act stronger because of being in Christ? Answer, you're dragging around a corpse. I know that sounds very graphic, but you're living out weekend at Bernie's every single day of your life, right? Right? You're bringing along all these old baggages and old sins and and trying to to live in those instead of accepting the free gift that God has given you at salvation and living in that freedom. You may know that you are a new creation, but you live as if you're still dead. You're trying to get the old nature to do all the things the new one does. And it doesn't work. Stop doing that. It won't work. And I think the reason we do it is because we feel guilty. Um, we, we run into a lot of guilt issues in our life, and rightfully so, because sin should make you feel some guilt, right? However, we often become very legalistic, and we become just like Nicodemus, and we start to throw all these external rules and laws on our life to help us continue to be trapped in guilt and in shame and in guilt and in shame. And Christ is asking us, in the stronger series, specifically specifically in Romans 8, be free. Come alive. Live in your new self. I feel that many feel that they have to just keep killing the old nature. And, and sure, we do. But it is exhausting and it continues to put unneeded shame and guilt on your life. Instead, my challenge for you this weekend and through this sermon is, is to learn and think and act and set your mind on the new nature, on the new life. Instead of just learning how to beat back sin and and to continue to, to, to push that old nature away, I want you to learn how to live in freedom, to learn how to live in grace and not in guilt. That's my hope. And that's my one challenge in this sermon is, is to really push you to say, do you live as if your old nature is, is, is calling the shots or do you truly live as if Jesus is calling your shots in freedom, in joy. There's a book that uh, I was using in some of the preparation of this, and uh, it's great. I've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again, but it's called Unchained. And um, he asked the question of why do we we say we're free, but we don't act like we're free. And he says one of the things that that is, is the culprit is that we feel guilty. And so he uses an analogy, and I'll show, throw this on the screen. He uses four different boxes. And these four different boxes he uses, he, he explains it in a way of saying that we live in different kinds of, of guilt. And so you'll see the boxes there. The, the first box is, is this idea uh, of, this, of the square that's around you. And uh, as you're in this square, you, you can see it's, it, you're trapped, right? 
You, there, there's no way out. You're just a box and you're, you're stuck inside. In the second box, you can see that there's there's you kind of rising up out of it. And then there's the, the open one, but you're at the bottom. And then the open one where you're at the top. And I want to explain each of these in detail uh, the way that he does. I think he does a really good job of explaining why we are the way we are in this idea of guilt. He says the first box is called being guilty, but feeling unguilty. He says being guilty, but feeling not guilty. It's the, I'm going to do me, right? I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to just do whatever I want to do. And I, I, I'm, I'm theologically, outside of Christ, I am guilty. I am an, a, a, an enemy of God, is what the Bible calls it. But I will live as if I have no problems or no concerns, right? That's the first box. And for those outside of Christ, you may be there, right? Um, you, you, you never accepted Jesus Christ. You don't have a relationship with him. And so I'm just going to live as if I'm not guilty, right? I'm going to just live it up as much as I can. The second box is called being guilty and feeling guilty. And this is beautiful, right? This is where God reaches and gets a hold of Paul's life, who actually wrote these words. Paul was uh, accused by God of kicking against the goads. <laughs> In other words, it was like he was trying to just out like maneuver God. He was trying to, to bang his head up against the wall of grace and God. And he's like, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen. And yet God, in his sovereignty, pursued Paul and pursued you and pursued me and said, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to love you in spite of it. And here's the beautiful thing that happens at the point of accepting Jesus Christ. We are convicted of being guilty and feeling guilty. It's the thing that draws us to repentance, right? It's called convicted, being guilty and feeling guilty. And then there's the third box. And this is not being guilty and yet feeling guilty. That's the third one. It's, it's this thing where the, the lid is off. There is freedom. There is a whole world that Christ in you is saying, live in your new creation. You're born again, live in it. And we look at it and we say, mm, no, I, I can't do that. I can't live in freedom. I, I'm going to stay in my box. I, I'm better with guilt. I, I really like guilt better, so I'm going to stay in, in the guilt. This is what he calls miserable. <laughs> and, and my fear is that many of us may be in the miserable phase where we just feel guilty all the time, right? God, I, I think I've confessed everything to you, but just in case, let me just, let me just heap more guilt on myself and, and announce some things that maybe aren't even sins, but I'll do it anyway, right? Uh, the fourth one would be not being guilty and not feeling guilty. And that's where stronger comes in. If we're going to be stronger, that's what I want to call us to, to live as community Bible church, as believers in Christ who are not guilty because of Christ in us. And then we live as if we're not guilty. And the key to all of this is surrender. The key to killing the old man and putting on the new self, the key to living in this new self and not heaping up guilt after guilt after guilt, which side note, I think we learned that pretty early, right, in church. If you've grown up in church, the whole thing of not being guilty and yet feeling guilty, I think that's pretty natural. Every single Sunday you're told things you're not. You know, you even get the phrases growing up, maybe like like in your home, it's the thing of, you know, starving kids in Africa would eat that kind of thing, and so you feel bad, and there's extra guilt on top of kids in Africa who aren't eating your, your meals. There's just guilt after guilt after guilt after guilt. And sometimes in the Christian world, it just gets more and more piled on. But... Paul, Jesus, is asking us to live and to kill the old man and to put on the new man, to push him off the cliff, as it were. And surrender is the key. This is going to sound so simple, but I promise you, for most of us, it'll be the hardest thing we do, right? You ready? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. And here's, here's, here's what I mean when I say surrender. Surrender is the key. You want to be stronger? You surrender. And I want to just give you two things this morning to contemplate and to do when it comes to surrender. First off, if you want to get stronger, if you want to grow in this new life and this freedom, part of, getting, part of this surrender is asking for help. There is nothing harder for many here at Community than actually asking another human being here for help. Why? Could be guilt probably a little more pride than guilt could be guilt and fear guilt and 
pride and maybe we've all learned self-sufficiency from an, from an early age. Um, and we've learned we just got to take care of ourselves and control everything. And we've learned that you should be more, more grateful. Um, and, and we all run into problems, right? Uh, of, of lack of gratitude. And so we just feel like as if we, we can't ask for help because there's other people struggling where we aren't. And again, it could even be self-sufficiency. There's a, there's a story, um, from another pastor in a book he wrote, and uh, he gives us as an example uh, when it comes to the, the dangers of clothing yourself in self-sufficiency. He says this of a person that he calls Teresa. He says this person, we'll call her Teresa, she shares her story and the result of clothing herself with self-sufficiency. Feeling insecure, I tried to control everything and everyone, but that gave me a false sense of security and made the people around me feel miserable. Rather than make my marriage and husband my top priority, I made the children the top priority. Sensing a lack of approval from my husband, I became Miss Efficiency. I had a place for everything and I put everything in its place, including everybody in their place, hoping to find approval. But my controlling spirit only made it harder for people to approve me. I also needed attention. In a twisted sort of way, I got my husband's attention by nagging him and presenting ultimatums. When he did not respond the way I wanted to, I tended to become even more critical and negative towards him. Not a pretty picture, is it? She says. I was fast becoming a critical, negative, controlling person, living a self-sufficient life and needing no one. But the world I created was a world of hurt. My selfish, self-defeating attitudes and actions shut the people I loved out of my life. The love I once had for my husband grew cold and I felt rejected, disconnected, and very much alone. You see, the thing with self-sufficiency, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. Until eventually, you don't need anybody. And you're alone. And you wonder how you got to be so alone. And then you get angry because people aren't with you. When in reality, it's your own doing. Ask for help. Admit you need help. Surrender comes when we can ask for help. Surrender your pride and ask for help. That's That's... Step one is stronger this week. Number two, be transparent. Be honest. Admit weaknesses. Being transparent requires trust. It requires relationship. It requires weakness. And to the men, especially this morning, can I just encourage you and challenge you this morning when we say transparency? Man up and confess your sins to one another. Many of you are hiding. Many of you are living in that old self and that old man and that old nature and you're holding on to things and you're hiding things because you're scared to death somebody's going to find you out. You're scared to death your wife's going to find you out. You're worried your, your kids are going to find out you're a failure. You're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're worried that the coworkers are going to find out that you're, you're not who you say you are. And You've got all these things that are going against you. And in order to truly become stronger, you have to surrender. And part of that surrender is becoming more transparent and not trying to fake it. Because here's the thing I know about secrets. Secrets never stay secrets. They never do. They ultimately come out. And I would encourage you, be transparent with your spouse. Be honest with her about what your struggles are, with, with what you're, you're facing, with what you're feeling. I don't have feelings. Find some. <laughs> um, it's going to be that thing where you have to learn how to become more transparent, to admit where we've fallen short, to admit that we need the help. Being healthy and transparency and confession will make you stronger than you know. I'm so grateful for uh, guys in my life, um, for my wife, um, that, I, that I have people around me that I can just be honest with and I can be transparent and say, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I'm just really beat down and tired. I, I, I really need you to understand. I've really been struggling to love you properly. I've been really struggling with my job. I've been really struggling if I'm going to make it in my job. I'm really struggling if, I, if this is even the career for me. You need to be transparent with those around you. Transparent with those who have Jesus Christ in their life. Confessing our sins to one another is a command in Scripture. And I would encourage you, the first step of being stronger through this 
crisis, through just life in general. If you want to be stronger, if you want to be bolder, if you want to be more um, in charge, you want to be uh, more of a leader, you want to be more mature, be transparent. Open up with somebody that you trust. The best leaders that I know are transparent and genuine and authentic and aren't faking it. I would just encourage you this morning, let's get stronger by surrendering. Let's get stronger by burying the old man and living in freedom in the new. As we close uh, this morning, I want to just say, Jesus Christ first is our example. I'm going to show you that in a second. And then we're going to share who you are in Christ. We're going to give you some verses, and then we're going to have somebody pray for you specifically, that you would believe the truth of Scripture in your life, that you could live free. And then you're going to hear a song from a friend of mine uh, about this whole idea of, of letting the old man fall away. And I want all of it to kind of be this time to reflect and ask God during this couple minutes we have this morning, what do you want to do? Maybe some of you, it's, God, I'm tired of living the old life. I'm tired of, tired of trying to fake it till I make it. I'm, t- I'm tired of being alone. And maybe for you, the challenge would be, I got to call somebody this week. I got to be honest. I got to confess some things. I just got to get some things off my chest. And I got to find freedom again by being transparent and being uh, surrendered. We see this in Jesus. Jesus gives us the perfect example in John chapter 5, verses 19 to 20. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him, so that you may marvel. Jesus knew surrender. He was the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. And yet he shows us what it means to surrender. He says that the Son can do nothing out of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Community Bible Church, here's my, here's my hope, my prayer through this next four weeks. Do we become stronger through surrender? Stop trying to fake it. Stop trying to be all these things to everybody and ask for help and be transparent. Bury that old man. Bury that old, that old nature. Live in freedom. We're going to learn more about that in the next couple of weeks, but... We're going to have somebody read some scripture and pray with you. And as we do, again, I would encourage you, get the family around, pray together, listen to the song as it comes on. It's going to be a new one. We've never done it before. It's it's not a one we do here, but I thought it was really um, applicable to to the subject today. And then stick around for the kids after. But know that I'm praying for you. We can do this. We're going to be stronger through this. And I'm praying. Good morning, community. Uh, I'm going to read some truth for us this morning, and I want us to hear them and know that they are true in Christ. And then I will pray for us. Number one, you are chosen. Ephesians 1 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Truth two, you are the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Number three, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new one has come. Truth four, you are a child of God. Galatians 3.26 says, for in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God through faith. In 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, Paul says, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not the night or of the darkness. You are forgiven and redeemed. 
Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Truth 6. You are a royal priest. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Truth 7. You are chained to God so tightly that nothing can rip you from his hand. I love that truth. You are chained to God so tightly that nothing can rip you from his hand. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the final truth, you are called to a holy calling to be a saint. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8 and 9. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Let's pray. Father God, would you give us comfort and peace and joy in knowing these truths? God, in the midst of chaos and in the midst of uncertainty and fear in everything that is going on in the world around us, God, would we cling to your true, never-changing word? God, I am sure that there are one or two of these truths that truly speak uh, to each and every one of us. God, I pray that we would have those on the forefront of our minds this week throughout today as we continue to face the challenges and the things that come towards us. God, would we rest in your truths. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, um, I guess my name is Dan Price. i um, been friends with Joel for a long time since I uh, worked at Camp Carl way back in the day. Um, this song is called Let the Old Man Fall Away and uh, wrote it kind of as a song of both confession, but also clinging to the fact that God's righteousness has been placed on my life um, because of Jesus. And so the freedom that comes with that is amazing. Um, and and that's kind of where this came out of. So it's, it's let the old man fall away, um, let him fall into his grave, and let the new man rise up in his place because Jesus called his name. So when God the Father looks at me, he now sees the righteousness of Jesus. Um, which is really the core of, of the gospel and of where our identity is placed. And so um, here it is. Would have been 
and so finish. It's in the keep on winning. It's his plan to the beginning. We call his name. His initiation, we worship with elation. Sinners to motivation when Jesus called our name. Let the old man fall away and fall into his grave. And rise up in his place with Jesus called his name. Let the old man fall away and fall into his grave. And rise up in his place with Jesus called his name. Just a sinful man, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. I'm just a sinful man, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. I'm just a sinful man. Just a sinful man. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Let the old man fall away. Let him fall into his grave. And let the new man rise up in his place because Jesus called his name. I thought that was just a perfect song for where we're at in, in Romans. So the parable of the tax collector where he says, you know, Lord, I'm a sinner, <laughs> have mercy on me. Um, is just so like, if we don't cling to our repentance, we're not really clinging to our freedom in Christ either too. And so I think those two things like just go together. Um, so yeah, no, I agree. Thanks, man. That's awesome. No, I appreciate the time on it, man. Appreciate you hearing from you directly on it and yeah. uh, our people are going to love it. So I really appreciate awesome. the time. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Thanks, man. Love we'll you, bro. See. Yeah, love you too. We'll see you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Hi, community kids. It's Miss Monique. I miss all your smiling faces so much. You're probably wondering why I'm dressed like this. I am dressed like our char Bible character today that we're going to learn about, Queen Esther. The Disney princesses had nothing on Queen Esther. The king of Persia picked a queen and he picked Esther to be his queen. Esther was Jewish, but she didn't tell the king that. One day, her cousin Mordecai heard about a plan that Haman had, who was a very important leader to the king, that Haman wanted to kill all the Jewish people. And that made all the Jewish people upset. And Esther saw that all the Jewish people were upset and she wrote a letter to Mordecai to ask why. And he told her that Haman had a plan to kill her and all the Jewish people. He said, you need to go talk to the king and save us. Maybe this is why God chose you to be the queen of Persia. And she told Mordecai, I can't just go up to the king. He has to give me permission to speak by holding out his golden scepter. So Esther told Mordecai and to tell all the Jewish people to fast and pray for three days. And fasting just means they didn't eat. They were in constant prayer for three days. And on that third day, Esther went to the king and you know what he did? He held out his gold scepter to give her permission to speak. And he said, Esther, what do you want? I will give you anything, even up to half my kingdom. He, he really cared about Esther. And Esther said, I, Esther invited the king and Haman to a feast the next day. And the king and Haman agreed and came. And after that feast, the king said again, Esther, 
What do you want to ask me? I will give you anything, even up to half my kingdom. And Esther told him about the plan that someone had made to kill the, her and her people. And the king became angry and asked who this person was. And she said, Haman. And the king punished Haman. And then he put into law that none of the Jewish people's enemies could harm them. Isn't that amazing that God used Queen Esther to save her people? That sounds really familiar, doesn't it? We just came out of Easter. Do you know, like Haman, Satan had an evil plan too to, to harm God's people? And when Jesus died on the cross, Satan thought he had won and he had beaten God and that we were all going to be punished because of that. But God had a different plan. And when Jesus rose from the grave, we, he beat Satan. And Satan held no more power over us. And if we believe in Jesus, Jesus is the one who saves us. Isn't that amazing? I really hoped you heard it, or loved our intro to Queen Esther. Now you can go watch the video. Have a great week. We're praying for you. King Ahasuerus was the king of Persia. Many years earlier, when Cyrus was king, he sent some of God's people back to Judah to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Some of God's people stayed in Persia. God's people were called Jews because they were from Judah. The king of Persia chose Esther to be his queen. Esther didn't tell the king that she was a Jew. One day, Mordecai heard that Haman, an important leader who worked for the king, was planning to kill all the Jews. Mordecai was upset. He was a Jew. He didn't want all the people he loved to be killed. Mordecai and all the Jews cried. Esther didn't know what was wrong. She sent a messenger to ask Mordecai why all the Jews were upset. Mordecai told Esther about Haman's evil plan. You have to do something, Mordecai said. Ask the king to stop Haman. Ask him to save the Jewish people. Esther sent a message back to Mordecai. No one can approach the king unless the king calls for that person first, Esther said. The punishment is death. Unless the king holds out his scepter, then you may live. You're a Jew, Mordecai said. If you don't stop Haman, he will kill you too. Maybe this is why you are the queen. Maybe God put Esther in the palace to save her people. Esther asked Mordecai and the Jews to fast for three days. Then Esther would go to the king, even if it meant she might die. On the third day, Esther went to the king. He saw Esther and held out his golden scepter. What is it, Queen Esther? The king asked. What do you want to ask me? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. Esther said, Would you and Haman come to a feast today? So Haman and the king went to Esther's feast. After eating, the king said, What do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. Come to my feast tomorrow, Esther said. The king agreed. The next day, Haman and the king went to Esther's feast. After eating, the king said, what do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything, up to half my kingdom. Esther spoke up. There is a plan to kill me and my people. The king replied, who is responsible for this plan? This evil enemy, Haman, Esther said. The king was angry. He punished Haman and made a law to keep the Jewish people safe from their enemies. God was in control over Haman's evil plan to destroy the Jews. Like Haman, Satan wants to ruin God's plan and destroy believers. Satan thought he had won when Jesus died on the cross, but God raised Jesus from the dead and defeated Satan once and for all. All who believe in Jesus are rescued from sin and death.
Troubled times, it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. I humble all I am, all to you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You're the only one. Yesterday, today.